Greetings and salutations, everybody. Good day. I uh, if I look a little panic, I just moved my mic and it shook like the whole thing was going to fall apart, which the arm like fell apart like last week. So I'm like on edge for this thing to just totally shatter and destroy while I'm speaking. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the 10th edition of Code Break. I am happy I made it this far. Hopefully a little bit, hopefully I'll last a little bit longer than a 10 um, and hope that you are all having a good day. I'm already seeing a lot of people commenting. I really, really appreciate that. It was very quiet last session, uh, but I had really good comments last session. Uh, so I appreciate the chatter. Every time you send me a comment, I get you know, a little serotonin release. So it, it, all, it all works out great. Uh, so this week, uh, for those of you who were not here last week, we are going to be talking more about IndexedDB. Uh, if you have never heard of that, this is going to be kind of a throwing you in the pool on the deep end type introduction, uh, because I introduced it last week, but it is essentially a NoSQL database for the browser. Uh, it is consistently supported across all the major browsers, so it's 100% safe to use. It's also been around for, I think, maybe 10 years or so. It's definitely not new. Um, I, I came to it kind of kicking and screaming because there was actually a SQL database in browsers uh, based on SQLite that worked really, really well, but got deprecated and removed. And I, 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 I cried a bit over it. Uh, but um, I've been using IndexedDB off and on for a while now, and it is still somewhat clunky. Not clunky, it's, uh, it's not simple. You know, if you're used to web storage, AKA local storage, then you know just how incredibly simple that is. And uh, it's simple, but it's also, you know, there's not a lot of features to it. It's a key value system, whereas IndexedDB, when, when used properly, gives you a lot more power. So let's actually get into the code. And I am going to move my window over here. As a reminder, when I do this, it means I am uh, looking to see if y'all have any cool comments and stuff like that. And let me get my stuff prepared here. Uh, before before we uh, I get into the code, into the review, I want to show you, I'm pretty sure I didn't mention this last session, uh, but this is the uh, new fur baby we got, I think the day after my last session. This is a uh, Wednesday Adams Camden, our new little kitten. Uh, she's been home for almost two weeks now, and uh, she is doing really, really great. It's funny because we have, we have six cats, don't judge, um, four of which are significantly old. Uh, so it's it's funny because we have these four old cats who are kind of slow and they're set in their ways. And we have a cat that's about, I think, eight or nine months old. And we have this one, which is about six weeks old. And seeing the personalities of the young ones around the old ones is funny as hell. Uh, so yes. Uh, but let me show you the application we were building and talk about the code as a recap, and then we'll get right into the new stuff. And just uh, a couple of points I want to make. Uh, don't forget, anytime you use client-side data storage, the client, that's me, the uh, the user, they can see that data. Uh, they can remove that data. They can even edit that data. So it's 100% not to be trusted. The operating system can also just willy-nilly decide to delete it. And I shouldn't say willy-nilly. You know, typically it's you haven't used this for a while and space is cramped, and then I'm going to dump it. Uh, but you know, as long as you think of it as persistent, not permanent, per permanent, permanent, yeah, one of those words, um, then you're good to go. Uh, I still think it is incredibly useful, even with that in mind. Uh, so. This is the application that we started working on. And I see Sue was in here. And I, I thank Sue because I was talking about what kind of application I wanted to build. And I was like, I don't want to do a to-do app uh, because like every web app tutorial out there is a to-do application. 
Uh, I got nothing against those. By the way, Microsoft makes a really handy to-do application called to-do. Uh, and Sue said, hey, you should do recipes. And the reason I love that idea is because recipes can get incredibly complex. And if I was building you know, something real for production use and using like a real database, I would probably, and, and uh, my, my buddy Scott is here and he's a MySQL evangelist. Scott, don't get upset. Uh, I'd probably think about a NoSQL type solution because I, I would feel like recipes would fit in there better. Um, and Scott, if you could prove me wrong with MySQL, I would love to hear about that. Um, so yeah, so recipes can be complex, but we decided at least for this initial release to keep them a little bit simple. So our recipes have three things. They have a title, they have ingredients, and they have directions. Both ingredients and directions would absolutely be better as an array of data. And in fact, ingredients would be better as an array of objects. So you have flour and then the quantity. You have salt and the quantity. By the way, uh, one of the weirdest things you discover when you start really cooking, I didn't really start really cooking until a couple of years ago during COVID, like a lot of people, uh, you don't realize how important salt it's like, I literally just thought it was what you added to French fries and, and that's it. Uh, but yeah, so ingredients could definitely be really complex. Um, and directions could also be an array and each array could have a duration and stuff like that. But we're keeping it simple for now. Um, and you know what, I'm going to share this because Scott, they shared this. Yes, Scott, you and I, you know what we should do is I should have you on this show and we should work on something together and you should show me that. Um, there you go. Because I invited him, he has to come now. So this is the application we had. Uh, currently, it only supports showing your recipes and letting you add one. So I will just type some random stuff like that and hit save. And we have a recipe and I'm only showing the title. Let's make that a little bit more obvious like that. And like, so let me scroll this down a little bit. So not the best UI, um, but it works. And one thing I want to kind of keep in mind to y'all is that uh, I, I really want to focus on the index DB aspects, the actual kind of database stuff. The UI UX of this is going to suck because we're doing it live and it's a first draft. Uh, but, and again, this is probably obvious, but that's not a, a you can't blame IndexedDB for that, if that makes sense. Uh, you can absolutely build a, a really powerful recipe web application that's really easy to use and works well with IndexedDB. Uh, versus this kind of bare bones one that I'm building now. So if we think about an application as having CRUD, create, read, update, and delete, we have create working, that's that form right there, and we have read. Let's look at that code real quick, and then we'll start talking about doing updates and doing deletes. So. Uh, HTML is basically, I have a div for where the recipes are going to go. Um, and I have my form. That's pretty simple. Most of the work is in app.js. Oh, by the way, uh, and I'll share the repo at the end. In the last session, we worked on the application and I put it in a folder in my repo called IDB1. Uh, this is going to be an IDB2. And that way it's nice and separate and you could you know, watch the first video, see that app and watch this video and see this app. All right. So skipping over stuff that just going to work with the DOM, you know, variables like that and me grabbing them here. We begin by getting the database. Uh, if you remember, that's a multi-step process behind the scenes. So uh, I ask IndexedDB to open. I give it a database name and I give it a version. There are three events that could run, one being an error, which probably will never happen, but you should probably handle it. Second being on upgrade needed, and the third being on being on success. I mentioned this last time, but bears repeating. On upgrade needed is really vital because that's the only place that you can make changes or set up your database structure. So in here, 
uh, you could see that uh, the event has passed a, han a, uh, a handle to the database, and I am creating an object store. And you could think of that as a database table, essentially. I am defining a unique identifier and setting it to auto increment equals true. There is more that I could do here, but for right now, this is good enough. If for some reason I were to put this live on the internet and people were using it and I decided, oh, I need to modify my object store or I need to make another object store, I need to go in here, I need to change the version and this is where things get crazy and the on upgrade needed I now have to say, I uh, or I have to write code that says, if this is your first time here, here's the crap I did the first time, and here's the new stuff. If you've already been here, if your previous version was version one and now you're on version two, I only need to do the things that changed. So that can get gnarly. So <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> That's you know the you know, primary thing, but you know we. We all live in the real world, right? Where uh, clients tell us something and they're a hundred percent sure this is exactly what I want you to do. And you go live and they're happy. And then the next day they're like, oh, by the way, I forgot this important detail. So just keep in mind that it's gnarly, but you can handle it. For these videos, if I ever end up changing this, I'm just not gonna worry about it. We're just gonna dump the old data and move on. So that was getting the database. Uh, I'm gonna skip save. The way that reading works, I have an asynchronous function called get recipes. Everything involving data entry is gonna be with a transaction. And I grab my database and I create a new transaction. The first argument is an array of object stores that you'll be working with. Second argument is uh, you saying if it's read only or if it's read write. In this case, to read all of my data, I can get a transaction. From the transaction, I get a pointer to the object store. That's that line right here. And again, by the way, if I go too fast, you'll let me know. And then I fire off a request called get all. There are ways to get individual records. There's ways to search and all that, but this is the blunt to give me everything back. I'm calling this from a function called render recipes where that handles doing the HTML and stuff for it. So this is a good question. I'll bring it up now. When the browser purges a store, is it just the data or the whole store? It's everything. So the entire index DB would be lost. In that case, when you would come back to the web page, the on upgrade needed event would fire again. It'd be like your very first time. So again, remember, it's persistent, not permanent. Per, per, permanent. I do know how to speak English, I swear. So that was getting recipes. The process to save a recipe uh, is, again, going to be asynchronous. I'm going to skip over all the DOM crap where I read those form fields, and I could do validation and stuff like that. I'm not. Create a transaction. This time it's read write. And what I'm going to do is basically shape my data, which is what I did here. In this case, it's purely the form data. I can just take it as is and create an object out of it. And literally all I need to do is call is do put. There's an add method, but I'm going to talk later about why I'm doing just put. Transaction, again, we'll do a on complete. And I do my kind of UI cleanup there. So I reset the form. Uh, I run my code to re-render uh, the uh, recipes. And I resolve the transaction. So a <laughs> lot of kind of boilerplate code. But really, the database parts are not that bad at all. I mean, this is nearly almost 50% UI stuff versus the database stuff. So what I want to do is do my delete method first. And the reason I want to do that is because that's going to be a little bit simpler. So the way that I'm going to do that, and again, keeping in mind that I'm doing the bare minimum UI here, in my render recipes, for each item, I am going to add a link 
that will delete this and I'll put it in brackets with an exclamation mark so it looks important. And we will do an event on this of some sort. I'm gonna leave the event, I'm gonna leave the link blank, save it and just make sure I haven't screwed that up. And I have not, all right, so we have those links in there. So the next thing to do is actually have this do uh, a delete. And the way I'm going to do that, and I, I'm drawing, I'm kind of paused for a second here because I'm kind of remembering a small little issue. Um, after I render this into the HTML, I need to add event listeners to it. And I want to ensure that I don't have orphan event listeners and things like that. Uh, so I may, you know what, I may just switch to a button, which may not be the best choice. And you know what, I'm gonna add a on click to this. Please don't do this in production. And we are going to pass in the ID. Oops. That is going to be a literal value like so. All right. I'm really confident that this is going to work. Totally confident. So we're going to do async function delete. And let's make a delete recipe because delete is actually a keyword in JavaScript. Actually, you can see VS code is not sure if y'all can see that. Delete is reserved word that cannot be used here. How many of you were aware, and I would love to see in comments, how many of you were, were aware that delete was a reserved word in JavaScript? Like I knew this, I've known it for like 20 years and I about three weeks ago, I ran into an issue where I accidentally used that. All right console.log delete ID. And in theory, in theory, I can go in here and that's a big ugly button, but delete one, delete two. All right, it is working. Um, you know, inline event handlers are bad. Uh, if I felt more comfortable with how much time I had left, I would add an event listener um, based on a query selector and make sure that I didn't have any leave uh, hanging around when I was done. I'm gonna do that later off screen where I could ponder that a little bit in terms of the best way of doing it. So this is going to actually fire the event in terms of actually deleting. I'm gonna copy and paste some code that we've already used. Where is my save? There we go. I'm definitely modifying the database. So it's gonna be a read write. I'm gonna drop that in there like that. And have that. So I don't think I need E prevent don't do default, but I definitely need my transaction. So I'm going to get my object store. And in case you're wondering, yes, I have some code for this already. So I am looking over just to make sure I don't screw up recipes. And it is literally that. So very simple. But again, we're going to add our event listeners to the transaction to make sure it Fired okay. We are just going to reject if it went wrong. And it, this should never happen. Feasible, the operating system did something weird and locked the data behind the scenes, but this should not happen. But I'm gonna have the code there just in case. And our on complete, on complete, is going to resolve. Now, when this is done, I also want to re-render because I've modified my data. So I'm going to just call render recipes. So this is pretty much like the save work. Where is my save? 
Uh, yeah, same thing pretty much, except that's doing some UI cleanup. So in theory, that was delete, and which is not, that did not take long at all. So let's get rid of my ugly one, cross your fingers. And that word, I had no doubt at all. I, I knew, i really sure that was gonna work. Uh, but let's go ahead and make a few more just to make sure. Title C, 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 save, and we'll delete B. Bam, good. And obviously, if I completely reload this, this just persisted. So that data is just there. That error in console was just a fav icon, fav icon, fav icon. This, that thing not showing up. So we now have, we have create, we have read, although technically we're doing read all. Um, and we have delete. Now we need to do the edit. And this is going to be like 90% UI UX and like 10% actual database work because one of the cool things is that, I can find my save recipe. This line here uh, where we do the put of the new thing that we were creating, the, the new recipe, put is smart enough where if I pass in the primary key, it doesn't update. It's basically, I think they call that a upsert where if it's new, it inserts. If it's existing, it updates. And it's really handy and I pretty much just use it. So I'm gonna copy the lovely don't repeat this at home button for delete and put one in front for edit. And we'll just do edit. That's not quite as exciting. And uh, async function, edit recipe, Comsa like that. And in theory, I should at least get a console message. Edit two, edit four. Yes. Uh, and what you're seeing is I have an auto number primary key. So those older IDs that I had, ID number one, for example, that's gone forever. Uh, you do not have to use auto numbers. You can use different primary keys. You can use you know, something that you can generate your own UUIDs, for example. There's a good NPM um, package for that, but I am fine with auto number keys. So. First thing I am going to want to do is I'm going to write a new function that is going to get one particular value. And I am going to just really quick look at my uh, ch -ch -ch, look at my code for that. You know what? I am not going to look. I'm going to just write this, write this raw. Why not? Um, so first thing I'm going to say, let contact equals not contact, let recipe equal get recipe based on ID. And we are going to write a new function that's going to get a recipe based on an ID. Uh, this is gonna be also a read call. So I'm just gonna copy my get all, get recipes, and I should absolutely um, alpha sort this just to make it you know, a little bit easier to read, especially in my outline. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Yeah, make that a little bigger. Yeah, love, love the outline feature of VS Code. Uh, so instead of doing a get all, I am doing a get, and I am pretty sure of that, but I'm not sure. And what I do when I'm not sure, I go to MDN and I luckily already have the documentation up here. So I am going to look at the object store. That's again, the database table and look at the methods. And I am pretty sure it's just get and it is. And I'm pretty sure I just passed the ID and I'm resolving the res I'm resolving it. That should be it, except that I didn't make this a wait. And uh, yeah, that's totally going to work. So let's make sure that should, that, that should work. Yeah, yeah, 
It's totally going to work. I have no doubt at all. All right. So title, let me clear my console. Title C. And bam, it worked. And so one thing I want to point out here, uh, do note that the ID value, when I did my save, I didn't do that. Uh, and XCB took care of that for it, just like any other database system out there with an auto number primary key. But the value is coming back. So at this point, we are going to leave IndexedDB and go into the UI UX land. And the way that I'm going to do this, and I am not the best designer, but I am going to use the existing form and I'm just going to save the ID in a hidden field. And this button, save recipe, I'm just going to add a little bit of logic to recognize when I am saving versus when I am updating. Um, and that logic will be in the UI UX side, not the database side. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully. So I'm going to update those fields. So I had some variables. Sorry, I keep going back away from the uh, mic. Title field, ingredients field, directions field. So let's start with that. So title field dot value equals recipe dot title. Uh, ingredients field dot value equals recipe dot ingredients. And then finally, directions field dot value equals recipe dot directions. And the one thing we don't yet have is the hidden value for the ID. So we will just drop inside the form here, input type, eh, type equals hidden ID. We'll call this recipe ID, not just ID. And then we will add code. So we have a good pointer to that. Uh, I mentioned this last time, I just because of my jQuery years, I like using a dollar sign in front of my DOM pointers because it flags in my brain what it is. So we will have a recipe ID. And you know what, let's be consistent. I was making these pointers have field or BTN. So we will use field equals recipe ID. So now in edit, I can say recipe ID field dot value value equals recipe dot ID. And I am going to cheat a little bit actually and make this not hidden, make a text. That way we can you know see if it's actually working. All right, so we have that uh, field. Um, I am, by the way, uh, using a CSS library called Milligram. My buddy Todd Sharp, he spoke up in comments a few minutes ago. He introduced me to it. It's incredibly simple. Make things look nice in CSS. Uh, definitely a lot more lightweight than Bootstrap. Uh, you basically don't have to do anything for the most part. You just drop it in and it makes it prettier, shinier. So in theory, uh, if I hit edit on title C, all my fields should update, including the soon to be hidden field. Now I want save recipe to correctly handle this case. And this is how I'm gonna do that. Uh, back to the code. Again, I should alpha sort all this. Render save recipe. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is write a bit of logic that if the ID value, let's first get the, let's get it. Let recipe ID equals recipe ID field that value. Um, if the recipe exists, that means we're doing an update. I want to include that when I save my data. If it doesn't exist, uh, if it's essentially an empty string, I don't want to include it. So right here, you know, I created my object. And I want to include ID if it's not blank. So if recipe ID, ID not equal to this, recipe.id equals recipe ID. I mentioned a few minutes ago, the nice thing about the put method, it just works, new or old. And so basically, if it's a new thing, <laughs> I won't have the ID value there. So indexdb will know, oh, will know, hey, I need just to add this to my object store. 
if I have it, it will do an update. I am totally, totally confident in all of what I just said. So I say that, where is my edit? Oh yeah, I don't have to do anything because once I save, the save method already clears out the form fields. Ha, huh? it clears out the form fields. It doesn't remove, where is it? Where save recipe? Again, I need to alpha sort this uh, on complete. Bam, we need to also, do this. Now, if I'm doing a new value, a uh, new recipe, it's already blank. So that line is useless, but that is, that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. All right. So in theory, everything's going to work now. Uh, Brian got mentioned all straight HTML, no framework side. Yeah. Uh, love frameworks, but you don't, I, I don't need them most of the time. And why, why add that? Um, as I'm going to get my soapbox now. So you can all blame Brian when I rant and rave for about five or 10 minutes or so. Uh, being in developer relations, I spend a lot of time thinking about how people teach things. So anytime I'm learning something new, uh, I've got like two brains. This is why I can't get things done. I got two brains going on at once. So I have the brain that's like, okay, let me actually try to learn this cool new concept. And then there's the brain of, Okay, this is how they're teaching. I wonder, like, why did they make the choice to teach this particular way? Why are they sharing this information? I, you know, I'm always looking at documentation in a DevRel frame of mind um, because it's very obvious when people spend time thinking about what they're teaching. So that's a long-winded way of saying, like, my purpose here today was to teach you IndexedDB, not to teach you AlpineJS, not to teach you uh, Vue.js, et cetera. Um, this application is exactly the kind of thing I would use Alpine for because it would kind of handle the DOM stuff a little bit easier. But I did not want to introduce that to people, all your lovely people out there who may not know it and make it confused. So um, I spend most of my life confused all the time. I I want to do my best not to confuse other people. Whew. All right. Thank you, Brian, for letting me go on that little rant there. So in theory, actually, I, th I think I think everything is working. I think. So um, I'm going to click edit on title C. Again, we're going to make that form field go away in a little bit. And we're going to say title C edited, ingredient C edited, directions, just to be really sure. Directions edited and hit save, cross your fingers. And oh, it did not work. Okay. Well, let's find out. First, if I click edit, I bet it'll have a new primary key. Did not have a new primary key. Let's go to the judges. Let's look in our dev tools and open up the recipe object store. Oh, <laughs> I totally did this error on purpose. Totally. Um, <laughs> case, uh, Scott normally is my person to let me know when things are too small. I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. But if you can't see, uh, I set the primary key to four, but forgot it was a form field. So it was a string and it stored it. It's unique, uh, but it allowed a string. So we are going to delete that record. It never happened. And uh, that was a test for all of y'all. Y'all failed. I'm, I'm really sad. And actually do parse int here. Remember to do base 10, otherwise JavaScript guesses. So in theory, that should save everything, uh, fix everything, go back to console, give us a bit more space, just reload again, edit again, title C edited, ingredients edited, directions edited, and hit save, and booyah, sweet. And just to be sure, uh, let's make a new one, new recipe, probably cookies, moo, and save. And yes, so it properly handled uh, both a new one and an existing one. And again, this is horrible UI UX, um, but 
we have a index DB driven application now. We have a persistence system. Um, you could imagine this could be a system by which I am crafting recipes and it will sync with a server when I push a button or um, I could use IndexedDB only when I'm offline and actually when I get back online, start syncing that data up uh, such that I have a copy on the server. There's all kind of things that we could do here. So big breath of water. Um, one kind of important feature that we're missing here uh, is the ability uh, to actually search, uh, to actually find recipes. And that could get pretty complex, but we're going to try to do it in the next 25 minutes. If not, heck, we'll have a part three. And to do this, we're actually going to use the index part of IndexedDB and create an index based on what we want to search. Now, let me go back up to my Git database. That requires a change to the database. And in theory, if this was on production again, I'd write code to handle versioning from version null to version two, from version one to version two. Uh, I am just going to cheat and delete the entire database. Um, I'll do that in application. We're going to say bye bye, my recipes. Uh, wait here. Just delete the whole thing. Data may be stale. Let's refresh. I'm pretty sure I can drop the whole table. I could have sworn. That's all right. We'll just change the version. And we will, I really want to delete this whole thing. I'm saying that. And, oh, you know what? I will just, bam, I'll clear all my site data, including IndexedDB. By the way, that's that SQL database, Web SQL. It may actually still run in Chrome. I'm pretty sure Firefox dropped it completely and Safari as well. All right, that database is gone. There we go. All right. So uh, we'll keep this as one. I am going to create a index. And my thinking is that to keep things simple, uh, we're going to search on title. And you can imagine if you have, you know, 30, 40 titles, uh, I want to be able to type it a few, type some things in, and then uh, filter based on what I have typed. So to do that, we need to create an index. So I am actually going to get a pointer to the store I created, and we are going to create index. And it's been a while, and I don't remember the exact syntax, but that's all right because we can look at the documentation. All right, so this is going to create an index on the table. And I'm going to give it an index name and I'm going to call it recipe titles. And by the way, if I, y'all let me know if I alt tab too quick. Uh, the key path is, should be name of the index. Oh, uh, what it is indexing it on. And so that's going to be title. So, and then options. Uh, it is not going to be unique. Uh, yeah, recipe, I, mean, I can, you know, I actually, in my recipe database, my uh, Saffron app, I think I have a couple things with the same name and they're, and they're like variants. So I'm not going to make that unique. Multi-entry uh, is where you handle indexes on arrays. And I mentioned that a true recipe would have an array of ingredients and you could create an index based on that data, and multi-entry is how you would do that. We're not doing that, so we don't have to worry about it. And in theory, that is literally it. I'm gonna, first I'm gonna get rid of that uh, visible one, save it, save this, and I believe 
my web page reloaded and it's going to cause a problem. Let's see. Let me do one thing. Uh, so I'm using a uh, local CLI that reloads the web page automatically for me. I saved my HTML. I then saved my JavaScript. It reloaded twice. And I think it created the end of the database without the index, I think. I'm not sure, but that's all right. Cause I can just nuke it and then reload. And then in theory, in theory, I honestly don't remember if it renders. Ah, oh, it does. Look at that. Yeah. So DevTools does show me my index based on recipes. All right. So in theory now, um, I don't have to do anything to start having index populated. So I can say uh, cookies and we want bread. And what else do I make? I make pies. In case you're wondering why I can't lose weight, this is exactly why. Uh, beer, bread, why not? And etc. And in theory now, my index is getting populated yeah, you can see it's picking up the titles. It's pointing back to the objects. So we got that part done. Now what I want to do is add a search field so we can start testing this index. And I'll talk about how you uh, how you get stuff based on index. So that, that gets a little wonky. So uh, I have my div of recipes. And above that, I want to drop an input field for search and placeholder type to filter by title and home saw like that. And did it work? Yep. All right. And because I added something new in here, I'm going to give this an ID. We'll call it title filter. That's essentially, it's going to be search, but really it's going to be like a filter. Uh, and now I'm going to do that same routine I did of creating a variable for it, title filter field, and creating a, picking it up, oops, and JavaScript, title filter field equals title filter, what did I call it? Title filter. All right. And then the last thing I want to do is add a event listener to it. Um, I believe I want to use input. And you know what? We will filter recipes. We will test that out with the time tested always works method of doing console.log. So async, don't think it needs to be async function. Filter recipes, don't need the event object for it because I can just say let filter equals title field. No, title filter field dot value. And we will say filter on filter. So I believe input is every key press up and down, but I tend to forget. That's why I do this. Great, and the only thing not working is that I'm not actually getting that value correct. Let me just see. Oh, I even said that out loud, title filter field, that value. That's where I set it and I type something different. I am must be crazy. R-A-Y, R-A-Y. Okay, so now comes the fun part. What I'm thinking is that uh, as I filter, I am going to rerun that function render recipes, uh, which handle getting recipes and writing it out. I'm just going to keep calling that every time. And what's going to happen is that render recipes is going to get intelligence, it's going to pick up on the fact that we are filtering. So kind of think filter recipes may end up not being necessary actually i could just run render recipes uh but let's let's pass the filter along and we'll make that an optional value 
So I'm going to come back to this. We're not doing any deletes now. We're not doing any get individual recipes. We can minimize that. We're not doing any editing. I can make my editor a little bit easier. Render recipes now takes an optional filter. So let us do this. Console.log will filter with filter. And in theory, this will be blank on default and not blank. And you go, well, that's blank right there. And COO will filter. Okay, cool. So <laughs> now we need to chain that to, we need to essentially pass this value. I have three things that are calling each other. That feels overly complex. I'll not gonna do the premature optimization, uh, but we're gonna once again, pass on filter to get recipes. And we are going to make this be intelligent enough uh, to handle getting a subset. Now, even without having a index, uh, this line here, 163, or I should say 165, where I get the result, that has an array of values. And I could just use client side code there to say, if there's no title match, remove it from the array. I could do that, uh, but I'd be kind of missing the whole point of uh, getting items <laughs> based on, uh, or using the actual feature of the, of the database. So I am going to, I am going to bring out this line here and basically say if filter equals blank string, uh, just do what you were doing, get everything else, we're going to do something else. The thing that we're going to do, and this is where I think probably the most complex part of an XDB comes out, is that in order to get value, to do search, essentially, uh, unfortunately, it's not really search. And this this is probably the only real Achilles heel uh, of index that be where in something like MySQL, it'd be select star from recipes where title equals initial value and star. And it would just fuzzy match that automatically. You can't do that in, in, in IndexedDB. You can't. The only thing that you could do is create a range. And a range could be three kinds of things. It could be some beginning and everything above. It could be some end and everything below. Or it could be the things uh, from a beginning to an end. And to make things even more fun, all three of those options have, the, have a Boolean value of, do you actually include it? So for example, uh, if I was, if my recipes had a duration of how many minutes and I only wanted recipes that were, that took more than an hour, so more than 60 minutes, I can say greater than 60 or greater than or equal to 60. And I could get complex. So greater than 60, less than or equal 120. So it's gotta be more than an hour, but less than or equal to two hours. I, I have my options there but this is all gonna be based on range. And what happens is that we create that range, we pass it back to the object store and it will automatically filter, it will get the values that match. So that technically doesn't really feel like search per se, but that is the best that we have in an XDB. You can create multi-key indexes, uh, but if you get incredibly complex, uh, I want recipes that are more than an hour that are tagged with dessert and that include sugar, but the sugar is less than a cup, uh, something like that, you're probably going to be doing a combination of working with indexes because you'll get that native performance and then doing additional filtering in JavaScript where it'll be more grunt work. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind. So whew, that was a lot of talking, I apologize. We got 10 minutes left. Let's see if we can get this filter working. I am going to, again, go back to not the cat, 
uh, go back to the range. And it has been a while. So let's see if I can remember. I believe it is open cursor. Yeah, okay. So that's going to be two steps. The first thing will be creating the key range. And here the docs, I love this is exactly what I just said for the most part. Uh, and by the way, they do actually support a only, uh, which is the same as getting one value. I'm not sure why you do that, but uh, there you go. So we are going to do uh, a bounded region uh, that includes everything. And because we're doing a string search, this is going to get a little fun. So let me show you what I mean. So let me write this out in comments. If I type the filter equals COO, I'm searching for cookies. What I have to search for would be COO A to COO Z. And actually maybe even include the uppercase. I always forget what comes first and what comes last. But essentially I have to create that range because I want to match any possible letter after COO. So I'm going to create a range. And I, if I sound unhesitant, it is because I am very, very unhesitant. All right. So let's try this. Thank you, MDN, for being awesome. So I'm going to set, set my range equals. And we are going to create a IDB key range object. And bound is will handle. I want a bottom and a and a lower, and we're going to do it on filter plus a and filter plus z. Totally, totally sure about this. All right, and then with that, once we have that range, uh, the way that we use it is we use what's called a cursor. A cursor is going to take the range as kind of like a filtering system uh, and then return my results to that. Now it's going to return a, 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 a cursor object, maybe one item at a time. So we need to do a little bit of logic and you can see this in MDN uh, where we have to uh, essentially uh, iterate over every item. I felt like a lot. So I actually, I already have a transaction and read only, and I already have a copy of my store. So I just need to work with my store and open the cursor on that. And I like their basic code. And I know I'm going to be modifying this quite a bit. So let me do that. and go over here and make this a store. So I called my range a range and we're just gonna immediately tie into on success and get the cursor and if we have it, continue. Else we're at the end and I believe I missed a, like that. Yeah, totally sure. So they are actually immediately appending to the DOM when they do this. We actually want to keep a record. So I will say result equals array. And basically, if we have a cursor, notice something. Uh, the cursor will have the object and a dot value key. So I'm going to say result dot push cursor dot cursor dot value. We don't need any of this. We're going to continue and I see my typo there. And now when we're done, when it returns null in theory, in theory, the whole thing is done. Like I really feel, uh, I feel so sure about this. I think we can just resolve that result. So basically I made get recipes smart enough to handle that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, 
So I, I first encountered IndexedDB back when I was still kind of new to Promise. I think even before I knew Promises, really. Uh, the async aspect really kind of threw me for a bit. And I got over it. And then I got to this part. And yeah, it was difficult. So yeah, I am 100% with you. Nice thing is that, you know, once you write this code uh, and it works, <laughs> then you can spend all your time on the UI UX, which I, I skipped. Uh, but all right. So in theory, Git recipes now understands when there's a filter and in theory will reduce the amount of objects returned. I have zero confidence in this. Oops. Let me actually hit control S on the right window. And we go back and ah, request is not defined. Line 185. Oh, haha, because I always forget that let is block scoped. So we will just do let request, comb saw like that, and put that in there. Uh, because this, I should probably move that in there as well. Yeah, you know what? Let's let's do that. That feels a little bit better. I'm prematurely optimizing here. I shouldn't be doing that. But uh, yay, no errors. So Git recipe still works. That was my default, no range. Here goes nothing. Okay, it didn't error. <laughs> we'll filter on C. So let's actually, let's debug here in the next couple of minutes. Uh, let me just console.log, doing a range. I have no idea how DevTools will handle that uh, dump of that. CO. All right, so yeah, that should work. That, that looks right, C. So let's, uh, let's make sure I didn't screw this up. Console.log, got a cursor, cursor, and type again. And we did not get any kind of cursor at all. So let's see. My store is correct. It is my recipes. I am opening the cursor based on the range. Um, oh, I think... Uh, that's not it, wrong window. I think, um, you know what? The transaction needs to be on the index, not the store, <laughs> I, I think. Um, yeah, this, you know what? This may end up being a part three because uh, we are so darn close. That is the store. So let me just look. I feel like we're so darn close. And request contains interval over some data that is used for keys. Can we retrieve from an object store an IDB index using keys? Yes, I know that. Um, I wasn't supposed to open the range on the index, right? Let me see. Aha, uh -huh. I was supposed to get it on the index. So, so let me do this. So, if we're going to do an index, let index equals store.get index. Uh, no, that's not right either. So, where? Let me go back to my object store. I know that there is a way from the store to get to the index. And I'm just going to keep hitting back until index. Ah, okay. So it's not get an index. It's just, yeah, just index. That makes sense. So index, and I called it title. Let's go all the way back to the top. I called it recipe titles. And recipe titles. And I believe the difference here is that I opened the cursor on the index. I'm going to try this, and this fails. We'll punt to next week. 
All right, and holy crap. Holy crap. It worked. It worked, and I write n an hour. So uh, in theory, if I do like CR, that matches nothing. Uh, if I do B, matches beer, bread, and bread, and BR, BR. Oh, sweet. I had no doubt at all. All right. So uh, let me go back to this and wrap things up. First off, thank you all for hanging out for the whole hour. That was a lot. Uh, <laughs> and we have an ugly out. We can spend just as much time making it prettier. Let me say that uh, this version of the application is going to be up on the GitHub repository I'm sharing right there. It will be called IDB2, uh, and you could take that and you could play with it. Um, next session, uh, I'll probably move on to a new topic because my brain is hurting. Uh, but that being said, uh, thank you all, uh, especially everybody in the comments. I really, really, really appreciate it. Just, by the way, feedback to any of y'all. Any session you attend, the more that y'all comment, the more you make people like us happier. So please do it. Thank you very much for attending. And I hope you have a great rest of the week. And I will talk to y'all later.